Sure. Yeah. yeah. One minute. One minute. I'll come back. Yes. Right. So, good afternoon to everyone. I welcome all of you to the lecture series in nonlinear dynamics. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ganeshan, to you. I can say Dr. Ganeshan is one of the notable alumni of our department. He carried out his PhD in the Department of Physics and got awarded for it in the year 1993. Subsequently, he did his postdoctoral studies about three and a half years in University of Belfast, Ireland, in United Kingdom. Thereafter, he returned to India and changed his academic career from physics to engineering side. For the past 20 years, he is serving at various levels in Vellore Institute of Technology or VIT Vellore. Now he is one of the senior most professors in VIT, and right now he is the chairperson for the VIT Business School. And as far as his academic side is concerned, he brought several projects to his institution. His I can say he has brought to a tune of 47 crores to his institution. And he had visited several countries and several leading institutions like Stanford, Berkeley, Caltech, I can say a few. And he has also visited several industries, including Google, Apple, Microsoft, Intel, to name a few. So I can see he is working both at both at academic and industry side. So with this short introduction, I invite uh, Dr. Ganeshan to start his lecture. Okay. Uh, just a minute. Uh... So I can share the screen, right? Yes. Yes, you should, sir. Where is the option you have uh, uh, present your entire screen? Okay. Uh, not much familiar with Google. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we use uh, Team. Team, okay. Uh, just a minute. So we have different options here, right? Yeah. Uh, you can can uh, share a window or? Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I should share it. Entire screen. But it is not entire, sharing. No, no, you you haven't given the permission? No, entire screen. Then you can see a small picture inside that. Okay. You click that. Okay. Oh, then you need to share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, right. Then right. you open your file. Okay. Is my screen is visible? Yes, yes. You make it full full size, full size. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sendil Velan for giving me an opportunity to present uh, some of our work and maybe some of your work also I may be talking and hopefully you know how science and engineering can work together in the years to come and so on. I would also like to thank uh, uh, my professor and guide uh, Dr. Lakshmanan. It's my great pleasure in uh, giving a presentation in front of him. And I also I see my friend, I think Arul, is also there in the meeting. So it's it's a great pleasure and honor and uh, presenting some of our recent work along with what you people are doing it. And uh, so uh, you can feel free to stop me at any time where you have a doubt. So the title I have slightly modified, uh, you know, changed it as modeling nonlinear dynamical systems using, you know, AI based techniques uh, because uh, we are using a number of AI based techniques, which may be neural network or machine learning or deep learning. Many of these techniques are falling under the umbrella of artificial intelligence. So we can use all these techniques when we want to do a modeling of a nonlinear dynamical systems. So let me get into the details and uh, maybe time and again, I may also play some videos and uh, to give you, you know, a kind of feel of, you know, how, how important these problems are. So before starting the presentation, let me have a clear understanding of uh, what we are trying to solve by and large a given problem 
in science as well as you know in modern engineering for example if you take uh, the focus of science in particular like say in physics or even you know the classical physics and so on is to improve the accuracy and precision of measurements of any physical quantity it may be you know you want to measure the time very precisely or we want to measure the trajectory of a particle very precisely we always you know go to the science and then ask for fundamental physics and ask to give a solution or of course you know some of the problems which are well known and has been proven in physics in this direction or placing the satellites in orbits or uh, you know your projectile which you may study even in your first year you know mechanics paper if you start a particular object and start throwing it and if you want to know in future where this object is going to lie you can follow the path of it nowadays we call these as tracing the object you start at a particular position with a velocity and then you move in a specific direction once if you know uh, the underlying you know the differential equations or what we call the deterministic equations of motion at your hand then the problem becomes relatively easy so this is well known from the ages of you know newton wherein you know you know the f equal to ma which can be written in the form of a second order differential equation once if you know what are the forces which are acting then immediately you can find a closed form solution but in general such solutions are available analytically only if the variables of your system under consideration are connected in a linear fashion so that means once if i have a solution of a given equation of motion that describes the behavior of a system then at any given point of time i can tell maybe i can predict what is going to be the future so the interest in science and engineering in majority of the present day problem is you know predicting when i say i am trying to solve here we are looking from a prediction point of view can i make an accurate prediction right in future what is going to happen so that is the you know the main interest we see it for example you might have studied in our textbook how you know the harmonic oscillator is you know behaving and then you know you get an exact solution and you can find the path of the particle from a given initial condition and velocity if you solve numerically or even analytically also we can even plot and then you can represent them now let us look at the other cases where if the equations are non linear in nature <clears throat> then only for special cases we can find exact closed form solution in most of these cases we may need to go to recourse to special functions like you know elliptic integrals and so on say for example what i have shown is a simple example of a pendulum under the influence of a gravity so in that case you know i can write my solution in terms of you know elliptic integrals in most of the other cases where you know the uh, forces which are interacting with the system are very complex or complicated then what we need to do is we have to solve the problem numerically using some of the standard uh, you know integration techniques such as ranju kutta methods and so on so these are all the problems which has been solved for ages maybe for more than 30 40 years since the inventions of computers you know people have been doing it but then the problem where uh, we are going to face is that if the forces which are acting here for example here uh, the term which is involved is you know sin theta you can represent them easily and then you can solve imagine that if i have a coulombic term where if i have a terms like 1 over r or 1 over r square and so on the difficulty we are going to face is that to solve these equations even numerically we need to use infinitesimally small time steps so that means it is going to take ages for you to predict the future you can solve it even with the kind of you know computing facility that you have if you want to solve it it is going to take you know a reasonably long amount of you know time a large amount of time so for finding the solution and also predicting the future we need a mathematical model so the problem we are trying to pose is that if you have a mathematical model which is going to tell how the forces are acting and how these variables and parameters of the systems are interconnected then you know you can solve using analytical or numerical or maybe you know we are going to see the other approaches so this conventional approach which what people generally follow is what is called as a white box approach because i'm giving you an equation 
and then i am giving you an algorithm and then i am telling you the procedure how you can solve step by step once you accumulate all this data and then if you plot i can get the complete history of the system and then once if you are at a particular place or particular time if you want to know what is going to happen at a later time i can you know easily predict it and hence it is called white box approach so now off late you know what is happening is people want to move away from the white box approach so what in engineering we are doing currently is in modern engineering problems we try to solve complex problems where in the underlying variables and relationship between them is not well known see for example i am going to show you this is one of the tool we have built from scratch using python and what this tool is going to do is it is going to give a kind of a commentary or narration of a scene all we did or we are going to do is just to put a webcam in your vehicle and then you start to driving and then you know imagine as if you know i'm going to design a driverless car which is going to drive on its own so in that case the simple scenario is maybe ask somebody you know to tie uh, with a ribbon your eyes and sitting next to you is giving all commentary that you know what are the objects in front and at what distance they are at at one what angle they are and then at what speed they are moving in which direction they are moving so all this information not only one object but there are multiple objects are there and here the problem is you know you may be driving in a new road or in a new environment which you have never seen before so in that case you know what kind of you know uh, mathematical model i can build that can you know identify this object but also you know predict at what speed they are moving and which direction they are moving and so on so here the real challenge is one has to build a separate mathematical model which can describe the behavior of various objects but for example you see here in this complex scenario in our you know like market space when you drive even in your two wheeler you see that empty number of objects are moving we have a human being we have a cyclist we have a motorbike wala we have auto wala bus wala car wala and so on apart from that you have man made obstacles like you know the sign boards and uh, buildings etc are there of course they are all you know static objects but these are all you know moving objects so now what is happening is you need to narrate somebody you know to tell about all of them so once if all this information is given to you you can imagine as if even if somebody is you know uh, tying a rope in your eye and then you are able to tie all you are going to make a decision is you know whether i need to accelerate or decelerate if so how much and then i need to steer to the left or right and how much i need to steer to the left or right so that decision can be made provided only if the objects which are in front of you are known and especially when they are moving it is going to be you know very very complex so here you look at this is one of the projects we have done for a chinese uh, uh, you know company which they have outsourced it uh, to us so here the problem is identifying these objects and not only identifying whether there are person bicycle car etc or auto and also if you take any one of these objects it should automatically identify what kind of properties they have for example here if you look at the object which i have selected is a uh, is a, a car right and then it is saying it is you know occlusion none means i am able to see it fully and then you you can see direction is proceeding means it is coming towards me assuming that i am driving a car on this lane so i should know in which lane i am moving and then if there are multiple lanes are there you need to maintain a lane discipline so in that case each of these learn you need to not only find that there is an object which is coming towards me but also you need to know in which direction it is coming it is in the same lane means you need to apply brake if it is in the opposite lane you need not even bother because it is going to cross you or if it is in the same lane but if you are following you you are going slow but that vehicle is going fast then you need to overtake so in that case you need to change the lane so you need to you know watch which are the other objects which are coming in the other lane so the problem of you know identifying the objects and also finding what are their dynamical behavior and also uh, you know tracking right you, you you can't do it only once you need to continuously do it and you don't have only one object but there are multiple objects but all these objects are different in nature it is not that all of them are vehicle like you know in a train where uh, you know the the 
coaches are one by one so you can if you find one you can extrapolate the other you cannot do such things in this kind of you know situation so for this kind of problem right you know now people are running now we know that the driverless car is no longer a fantasy and there are a lot of companies in uh, san francisco and california they are already you know testing successfully and then uh, you know uh, it is it is becoming you know very very popular so in in modern engineering we are trying to solve such a complex problems wherein the underlying dynamical variables and what is the relationship between them is not very well known so in fact you know the model which we have built we have built nearly 29 different models and then we have put it into a single algorithm and then you feed a video and then you know it is going to identify all these objects and then it is going to characterize all its properties you know you, you need not do anything like manually so those kind of you know is the problem what people are addressing so uh, the typical example as i mentioned is driverless car and people are also now using robots which are used in disaster mitigation when you talk about you know robotics you may think that it is all matured but again the difference is the robots which are used in industry maybe in uh, surgery or in uh, car industry and so on so they are all you know static robots uh, where you know the parts are moving in a conveyor belt in a and your lighting system and then your camera are all in fixed location but the kind of problem which i am talking here it is very very different because even the lighting is going to make a lot of difference what kind of you know sensor i will use what kind of accuracy i will have whether it is daytime morning time so sometime it may be raining you may have fog you may have snow all these you know challenges are there and hence you know you say it's a very complicated dynamical system not one but are many so people are trying to address you know this kind of you know problems so uh, the, the point i would like to try to make is that the way you have been working in the nonlinear dynamics taking an isolated system and then given an equation of uh, the given the underlying equations of motion and by solving them is not sufficient for us so we need to look something an alternative approach so defining the underlying equations of motion is not that easy here and also the values of the variables are not known precisely and uh, this is you know another you know important thing you know we need to look at in the modern era what happens is unlike as i mentioned in science the importance is given for precision and accuracy but then in modern engineering problem solving the importance is not we are interested in exact values so in fact you know people are trying to use only approximate values from that approximate value can you make you know decisions for example when you are driving a car we do not know at what exact speed and direction an obstacle is crossing the road i think you know most of you who have been you know driving two wheeler or four wheeler you might have seen that when somebody is crossing on the road in front you are not going to use some you know like physical experiment asking that this fellow is crossing in front of me at 12.2 degree in the northeast direction and then you know he is going at 24.7 km speed he is approaching you are not going to get all those data all your brain does is only approximation so you you get a data that he is you know coming very fast or you may say that he is very close to me so the kind of you know the variables that you are going to talk and then the data that you are going to get are considered to be approximate even if you get a you know the sensors which you use maybe radar lidar etc in your vehicle when they give a precise value what we try to do is we try to approximate them and then you know we want to use a logic to solve the problem so the the interesting point is uh, that we need to note down is that the equations of motion of the various objects which are on the scene in front of you are not available and second is i am not interested in exact or precise values unlike in physics or in science where our interest is on improving the accuracy of our measurement and then again the third important thing you can look at is most of the decision making here because when you say uh, given a driverless car i want to take a decision that do i need to apply brake if so how much of you know pressure i will apply on the you know braking pedal you know again all these decisions are in general as a human being you say that i will apply a sudden brake or i may say that i will apply a slight brake on on my you know braking system and so on so what we use in these cases are something called linguistic variables 
so the logic which we are going to use for solving this kind of problem to take a decision is something called fuzzy logic so in your conventional you know nonlinear dynamical systems the variables that you have used are the normal variables which are normally assuming you know numerical values which may be real or an integer positive negative it doesn't matter and also uh, you know most of the decisions that you make right are based on conventional logic which are you know we can call binary logic or digital logic and so on but then you know modern problem solving you know we are recoursing ourselves into fuzzy logic so these are you know uh, something you know which you need to keep it in mind when we solve some you know real time engineering problems in modern days and this kind of approach is what people generally call as a black box approach because uh, we, we don't have the exact information here and maybe i will show you a small video which again is going to you know show you what kind of you know issues we can face is the video is visible yes yeah yes so sir. what you see so what you see is you know we have mounted a camera on the uh, junction at you know velour near you know our vit and then you know we were watching the traffic density at any given point of time how many vehicles are going it may be car two wheeler bike human being and then based on this data this number is not going to be always constant it is going to vary from day to day and even time to time and also you know the numbers are not going to be always constant so it's going to be a, a you know a, a quite complicated number which you are not always going to get so <clears throat> now what people are trying to do is can i use this dynamic data about the traffic density at a given junction in different directions and based on that using the so called you know fuzzy logic can i control my you know like uh, uh, signaling system right so the challenge here is we need to detect moving objects as i mentioned it may be cycle car two wheeler bus human being and then it is going to vary time to time depending on the day of the week and time of the week and so on but then you know based on the data that you get if there are less vehicles coming in a particular direction why you need to have a constant you know signaling time people unnecessarily waiting when no one is coming in that particular direction can i reduce the traffic signal along that direction if there are more vehicles in a particular direction can i increase the traffic uh, you know uh, uh, green signal time more in that particular direction and so on so it's one of the live project we have done and then in the later uh, part we have even integrated with a fuzzy logic based controller system which can automatically switch on and off your uh, signal system automatically so the challenge here is again people want to solve this kind of you know problem which are realistic okay now there is another you know related word another paradigm shift that is happening in computing because uh, when we talk about you know in physics or even nonlinear dynamics we are talking of you know solving there is an equation and uh, under the equation of motion and there is a numerical technique and then you know you can try to solve by starting with an initial condition and velocity and then you will get all the detail that you want but then in the case of computing now there is a paradigm shift the conventional way you are doing computing is called hard computing but now people are moving towards something called soft computing so again in physics as i mentioned we are given the equations of motion we solve them using numerical methods so in hard computing we solve the problem by following step by step instruction so what you do in physics i will call it is nothing but a hard computing when i say a hard computing for example you take a sorting algorithm somebody is giving a set of number and then he is asking you to sort it either in ascending order or descending order it may be a bubble sort algorithm or selection sort some sorting algorithm where a step by step instruction is given according to the instruction you pass the input data at the end of it you will be getting an output which is you know started so this is what we conventionally use you may choose any programming language you like or any hardware which may be embedded hardware it may be gpu or cpu multi core parallel program doesn't matter but then at the end of a the day there is an algorithm there is a step by step procedure through which your data goes through your input goes through finally you get the output so this conventional approach for ages you know people were thinking this is the best way of you know solving problem and this is called as hard computing but in recent times what is happening is there is a paradigm shift lot of interest is going towards what is called you know soft computing 
right? So what is this soft computing is doing? In the case of soft computing, we try to solve problems using what is called learning based methodology. What I mean by learning based methodology, for example, when we are even taught, you know, in our life, there are many skills which are taught only by learning. For example, you take driving, singing, dancing, swimming, and so on. So it is not somebody is giving a running commentary and then asking you to watch a video and then put you into water and say, I have taught you everything. You, you swim and then come back you know, and learn and so on. So the problem is most of the skills which we acquire in our day-to-day -day life are based on the so-called learning method. When I say learning, it is going to be very effective only if you train the system with more examples and varieties. Suppose if I say, if I know driving, even if you go to a driving school, as a novice driver, you may be very nervous. You may not even uh, you know, go beyond the first or second gear initially. But the more and more driving you make, and also when you drive in different environments, then what happens is you become a kind of a professional driver or professional singer or a dancer and so on. So the, with the more samples or you know, with the data given to you, I would say in the parlance of AI, if more data with a variety is given, then if you are taught, you are going to become an expert on what to do and so on. So this is something called as you know, a learning-based approach. In fact, this learning-based approach is what the soft computing techniques are insisting. So some of the uh, modern you know, AI-based techniques which are falling under soft computing include the neural networks, machine learning, deep learning, and so on. So uh, here again, you know, you can solve some of the problems which has been never thought of in the past. So some of the example which I will show we have developed in our lab, which is falling under something called advanced driver assistance system. Again, again, this uh, advanced driver assistance system, what we try to do is we try to solve some of the problems which are very specific to the Indian environment. You see that unlike, you know, in uh, Western or European or American countries where the roads are well laid and well maintained. So there is no issue. But then, you know, in our country, what happens is the roads are not properly maintained and laid, unfortunately. And also we see that there are a lot of potholes and speed breakers and so on. So what as a, as a driver I want is to start with when I am driving it, when there is a pothole because of, you know, the rains during the last few weeks, you see that a lot of uh, roads have become, you know, pothole. The roads which were good last month has become with a lot of pothole. And suddenly when there are, you know, accidents happen, the, the highway people, they put speed breakers and so on. So there is no standards are maintained. What is the height of the speed breaker and what should be the depth of the speed breaker? And there are not even, you know, signboards are there. If such a kind of situations are there, how do I detect? Again, you know, these are all quite often, you know, changing. There is nothing like, you know, a static system. So now let's see that how do we solve this kind of problem? Again, this kind of problem can be solved using soft computing technique. And just to play a small video. So we just to put a webcam in our car and then we were driving in a road, right? You see that this was a video collected. And then, you know, this uh, indication is saying that you are going to encounter maybe a pothole in the road. And when you go further, you see you get an indication. So now we see there is a speed breaker. Now it is detecting the speed breaker and then it is giving an audio alert. And thereby as a driver, I will come to know that, that there are, you know, such obstacles are there or potholes are there and so on. So this kind of, you know, unsolved problems, which were never thought before, can be solved because they are all, you know, quite, uh, you know, now and then, you know, keep varying. So tomorrow, you know, if they lay down the road, probably I may not have even a pothole. So it is not like a signboard which is fixed at a particular position. So they are dynamically varying as the time goes on or the roads are getting deteriorated and so on. So for a detection of this system, again, we use the soft computing technique, which again use, uh, you know, some of these uh, neural networks and deep learning technique. In fact, we, here we have used deep learning technique to identify them, right? Uh, so any doubts here? So this is the general intro I have given. Now let me get into the details of uh, you know, uh, all these, you know, buzzwords, what is neural network, what is machine learning, what is deep learning, and how you can use them in uh, uh, nonlinear dynamics, and then see the way you are conventionally solving. I can also solve it alternatively using these 
machine learning or deep learning technique. Whatever you have been doing it using Ranjikuta method, I can do it with the soft computing technique. Uh, Ganeshan, I have a yeah. doubt. Yes. This, this uh, detecting speed breaker and uh, put holes mm -hmm. and other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is, is it I, I, what is the difference between IoT and uh, this? Okay. See, the IoT is something called the uh, Internet of Things. What we do there is you can attach a sensor with the system which is going to continuously monitor its uh, status and then put the data into the cloud. And then there may be a, a cloud or a server and there may be an analytic software which is running. It is going to give you an alert when certain events are happening right so there you know the the uh, the ball game is you know very different uh, say for example if i have a, a ups in my house i can put some sensor i can open the ups system and then you know that there are mosfets we have transformers and so on so i can put some sensor which can locally find what is the health of those you know components and then push that information regularly into your cloud and there is an analytical software, analytic software which is running in the cloud, which will continuously monitor. When the levels become beyond a critical value, it is going to send you an alert to you saying that, you know, your MOSFET is about to die or your transformer is about to die and so on. So the purpose of most of these IoT system is to monitor and alert you or maybe, you know, for making better maintenance. It is not part of an AI. You can okay. use AI, but it has nothing to do with AI. Okay. 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 Fine. So now let me go into uh, the neural networks and then we will talk a little bit because it is going to be the basis for most of our, you know, uh, deep learning. And then in fact, if you look at uh, the Lakshman Rekha between the neural network and uh, deep learning is, you know, very, very narrow, very, very small difference is there. But often, you know, people get carried away and then sometime, you know, they get misconsumption of it and so on. So what is a neural network? It's a, an information processing system that can model the human brain. From the word, you can understand that, you know, it is copying the behavior of uh, 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 a computing system, a tiny computing system, which is, you know, copying the behavior of your human brain. And of course, the artificial neural networks are performing various tasks such as pattern matching, classification, optimization, approximation, and data clustering so that means wherever you are finding or you can you can even use it for prediction right we are going to use it for prediction purpose so if you want to optimize some quantity or you want to do some pattern matching any of these mathematical problem you can always you can think of neural networks but then later we will see that this neural network is not something new it was there even in 50s 60s and 70s and so on but then where the breakthrough come we will see little later and why it has become, you know, so popular thanks to, you know, AI nowadays, we will see a little later. So these tasks are difficult for a traditional computers, which are faster in algorithmic computational tasks and precise arithmetic operation. As I mentioned, how the neurons or the neural processing unit are different from the CPU computers or laptops which you are using. Because these laptops and desktops which you are using are designed for solving complex arithmetical problem in a faster way, in an uh, in a in a very precise or accurate values. So the importance is do the repetitive task quickly without any making mistake. That is the logic of your conventional computer. Whereas in the case of artificial neural network, they possess a large number of highly interconnected processing elements, which are called nodes or units or neurons. Because these are the words which I am going to use repeatedly in the presentation. So you keep a note of it. So every single tiny processing element, which is, you know, mimicking the behavior of a human brain, I am calling it as a neuron, right? So uh, that's why, why we call network? Because not only one, but many of them are there and they are talking to each other. And then we are trying to use this, uh, you know, the artificial neural network to solve problems. So when you use artificial neural network to solve problems, we are going to use something called soft computing approach. So when you use a normal computer, I'm going to use hard computing approach. We need to design, you know, what operating system I will use, what programming language I will use, what algorithm I will use. That is the insistence on your traditional computing. But then when you talk about neural network, as I mentioned, 
we are going to teach the system just like you know we give a training we give you know a lot of samples ask the system to learn so that is going to be the difference so even though it is also doing processing the kind of processing which your neurons are going to do or each of these neuron are going to do are very very simple and in most of the cases it is going to be a simple algebraic you may not be using more than addition subtraction multiplication or division not not beyond that so only we use those very primitive you know operations using a neuron which usually operate in parallel and are configured in specific architecture we will talk about this so the beauty of neural network is they they operate in parallel it is not like a serial operation so you can take you know many of them they can work in tandem and then they can produce the result very quickly that's why you know our brain is able to do many tasks which if you want to ask your uh, computer to do it it takes a long time okay so each of these neuron is connected with the other by a connection link so if you typically look at uh, when i say a uh, 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 neural network when i say network means more than two units are connected together when you are connecting them there should be a wire or maybe a cable and so on so here we use the word link each connection link is associated with the weights which contain the information about the input signal so this word weights is again very very important from a neural network point of view so it is unlike your normal cable right which is uh, you know again you can think of as an analogy if the uh, if the wire is thick right you may be sending a high power signal if the wire is thin you may be sending a low power signal so the moment you see very thick wire you can assume that uh, you know the 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 power uh, throughput through that wire is you know heavy so i can imagine as if the the thickness of the wire is what i call it as weight this weight is going to be the brain of your neural network which i will talk a little later just to keep a note that the the, uh, the 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 neurons are all connected by means of a wire whose thickness is not same the thickness here means their weights are different ann's collective behavior is characterized by their ability to learn recall and generalize training patterns so why i use this you know neural network a collection of neurons working together i my aim is to teach to learn certain things or sometime you know i ask the neurons to memorize something so sometime i say even store the patterns thereby you know the next time when you show the pattern it is able to recognize and then tell what it is for example in the video which i have given you know i have i have trained the system with the patterns that corresponds and that can distinguish the mathematical model which is there between a car and maybe an auto even though you know there are uh, Uh, you know they are vehicles you see there are marked differences are there and the internal state of the neuron is called activation or activity level and it's a function of the inputs that the neurons receive so we'll again talk about something called an activation which is also a very very you know important factor because uh, you know how do you react for a given input and then you generate an output is highly dependent on the activation i will come little bit later with a very simple example i will tell how it is going to matter so the activation of a neuron is transmitted to the other neurons so i am giving some input signal asking my neuron to process and then when if it is when i say process means it is going to do some algebraic operations at the end of it i am going to ask its activation and activation here i mean is a kind of a thresholding function asking you know yes or no true or false so once if it is you know doing that activation i am going to get that output that output i am going to pass it on to the next neuron because it is a network right so uh, i take some input process and then apply my activation and then i generate my output and pass it on to the subsequent neurons a neuron can send only one signal at a time this is in fact the drawback of a drawback of an artificial neural network it can handle only one signal at a time which can be transmitted to other neurons so i may process one data but that data can be replicated to many other neurons which are nearby so this things you know you need to keep it in mind and this is a simple structure of a simple biological neurons in our human brain we have about 10 to the power of 11 neurons are there <laughs> so you just look at you know these jargons and let us not worry too much about it and so here what is the soma or cell body where if you look at this is what i call as the soma or cell body which is the black nucleus kind of a thing so what it does where the cell nucleus is located it is like your cpu so that means all the computations which you are going to ask your neuron to do it it may be even very simple it is done in this cpu 
and what we call cpu here i call it as soma and then the dendrites where the nerve is connected to the cell body because if you want any program which is running in the cpu it needs input so the inputs are coming through dendrites so what you see like you know fiber like structure or root like structure or dendrites you may get you know different inputs for solving a given algorithm you may give one input two input 10 inputs so depending on uh, you know the kind of problem you have you may be getting the inputs the inputs are obtained and then they are passed to your soma or cell body then you have an axon which carries the impulses of the neuron which is something called here you see that this is an axon after processing it i am going to get an output so the output is going to be passed to the next neuron right so in that case you need a kind of a you know, cable which is going to connect which i call it as an axon and then the end of the axon splits into fine strands as i mentioned this cable is not going to deliver it output to only one neuron but it is going to deliver it to many other neurons right i may decide you know to pass on my output to many other nearby neurons so in that case the unit which is going to split your data and copy it and give it to the other neurons is called as axon ending so each strand terminates into a small bulb like organ which is called a synapse so sometimes people call these as a synapse so with this synapse you know your next neuron will be connected through synapse the neuron introduces its signals to the other nearby neurons so this is something like you know gateway if you have one more neuron and this is one neuron this is taking your signal and then it is passing it to the next one something very similar to your gateway so you see that some of these you know jargons which i have used in our conventional computing or computer networks are also valid here but then we call by a different name and there are about 10 to the power of 4 uh, synapses per neuron in the human brain so how many such connections i can make one output of a neuron go to maybe you know even 10000 other neurons right now let us look at what is the problem i am going to solve here so the mathematical representation of the chemical processing which is taking place in any artificial neuron is given by like i said it is doing some processing what is the processing it is doing it's very simple it is you know like uh, a weighted sum that's all it is doing suppose if i give different inputs what it does is it is you know uh, adding some weightage for example here you take x1 is one input signal which is coming through this dendrite x2 is another x3 is another you take all these inputs and then you give a weightage w1 w2 etc and then you add them you multiply and add so it's a uh, you know the uh, sum of the product of weighted some weighted signals or weighted input signals and that is what we call as the uh, net input so once if this net input is coming you, we call this in a simple term as you know sum of xi times wi where i runs from 1 to n so here i represents the i to processing element when i say here so this cpu i may say i equal to 1 maybe if i have one neuron i may say i equal to 2 and so on so because there are many neurons which are working together in tandem now let us look at where this analogy comes in it's as simple as you were in you know, a examination system right so here for example all your x1 right maybe i will show you in the other diagram so this is the simple function of any neuron so what it does is it is adding for example if you take you have any exam for any subject let us say you have a mathematical physics subject is there and you may have the continuous assessment test 1 you may have continuous assessment 2 and you may have a term and examination and then i may decide as a faculty that whatever mark you have taken in your cat i mean your continuous test i may have conducted it for 100 but i will give 35% weightage for it and 40% weightage for your cat 2 and maybe you know 50% weightage for term and so on so i can decide what is the weightage and that's why i said these are your actual marks that you have obtained and these these uh, dendrites you know which are like cables which are taking the input and then taking to your soma are called your weight so i'm going to give different weightage and then what is uh, uh, you know the neuron is doing it is going to multiply the input value with the weightage multiply the second input with the its corresponding weightage third input its corresponding weightage and then it is going to add and this part is called the summation part so after doing this right what i am going to do is i have to make a decision the decision is i need to declare whether you are pass or fail right so that is what i call an activation so after getting all the input signal 
with an appropriate weight i am going to multiply and add and once if i do that what i do is i have to generate an output the output is i need to declare whether you have passed or failed so in this case i am giving a threshold for example if i say if your mark is more than 50 right if your mark is more than 50 you are in the pass if it is less than 50 i am going to call you or fail and this task is what is called an activation so typically any neuron has to do the multiplication of your input signal with an appropriate weight add and then apply it to an activation function then it can generate an output and that output is going to be passed to one or more other neurons so this is a fundamental operation of any neuron in your brain does as i mentioned it is simply adding and multiplying multiplying and then adding that's all it is doing this way so here the weight represents the sense of the synapse which is connecting the input output neurons so here in the diagram i have put all the same line but you can imagine if i put thick line means it has got more weighted thin line means it has got less weighted so something that is what we saw in biological neurons what the synapses was doing or in other words you can see that there is seems to be a close relationship between the biological and artificial neurons so in a biological neuron you have a cell here in artificial neuron we call it as a neuron and you have dendrites here we call it as weights or interconnections and you have soma it becomes your net input and axon it becomes output so now uh, what is an interesting part here is that now i ask you a question i know that these are all my input marks right and these are my results now i am asking you tell me what is the weightage i should have given for my internal marks and so on or in other words the the inputs are you know three you know like 35 40 76 and so on output is pass for some mark now if you want to connect the input with the output the only mechanism you have is this weight matrix in fact if you change the weight instead of 30% if i give 25 or instead of 40% if i give 50 right for the same threshold you may get a different output or in other words if the weightage be the same but if i make my pass percentage instead of 50 if i call it as 60 if i change my activation function again my results are going to be different so the Uh, the the toughest or the biggest problem in the conventional neural network is you know how do you choose your activation so guess you have multiple parameters so what people generally do is they will fix a particular uh, you know activation function we will come to that why we use a particular activation function why there are advantages and so on so once if you freeze your activation function then all you need to do is you have to play with the weights so in an iterative fashion right you can play with the weights you are you, you know that this is normally we call these as a supervised algorithm i am not going to tell you what is the weightage i am going to give for your internal mark or external but i know your input marks are given but in your grade sheet you have declared it as pass so now i am asking my system can you tell me what are these weight and that weight detection is what we call as the model right so depending on you are given an input you are also given an output so we call this as a supervised uh, neural network or a learning methodology where i give the input also i show you the output you need to learn what should be your weight or or in other words what is this weight matrix you need to determine so that you are going in a systematic way we are going to determine and that's what the whole uh, you know uh, uh, neural network or deep learning is going to do it now what people are you know taking let's take a typical a slightly you know different example here i have a neural network which has got layers and weight matrix so what i mean by layers because this is your you know input where i am going to have four types of examination and what is this hidden layer assuming that a student is writing five exams five subjects for each of the subject he may have two internal one may be termed and maybe another some assignment all these are there for each of these subject so the input from this is going to be given to each of the nodes which are in the next layer which are subjects and again you take there is one more layer which is something equivalently saying that whatever subjects you have taken again i can pass on that information so some of these subjects may have three credit some may have four credit some you may have two credits and so on so if you feed those informations and then you can pass on to the next layer maybe i can say that each of them it is going to say like your gpa how much is the uh, you know grade point average you have got based on the all the subjects and then all the exams that you have written i can call these as one node and this may be like 
for uh, uh, the second semester, third semester, fourth semester, fifth semester, and so on. So ultimately, you know, I'm going to generate an output where I'm going to ask, what is your CGPA? A simple calculation of a CGPA, when you want to train with a neural network, you simply give the input mark and tell this is my CGPA, and then ask these are the number of semesters I have gone through, and each of the semester, these are the subjects I have taken, and so on. And your problem is boiling down in finding what is this weight matrix here. So in fact, the size of the weight matrix here, for this particular part, we call this as a layer. When you have more and more layer, when you have many layers, we normally call it as a deep learning architecture. When you have very few layers, we call you know, the neural network architecture. Of course, there are other differences are there, which I will come a little later. So the whole crux of the game is here. When I say that, I'm going to build a mathematical model which is going to connect my input to my output. For example, if you take, uh, uh, even in the case of you know any nonlinear dynamical system, I'm going to give my initial condition or maybe my initial velocity. And then at the end of a time, maybe after 20 seconds, I want to know what is the output in which location this object is going to be. So you know what is the input, you know what is the output, but then what you are looking for is underlying you know, mathematical equation. You have given the equation, from that equation I was able to predict or able to detect what is my output. But here I am asking the reverse question. I have an input, I have an output. Can you tell me what is the matrix which is connecting the input with the output? Or otherwise, it's a kind of you know, a nonlinear mapping which is happening in a, with, with huge amount of data how do you ensure that in a systematic way this you know matrix can be settled? So how this works is if you take between the input layer and the hidden layer, if there are four inputs and then there are in the hidden layer there are five nodes. So the weight matrix size is uh, four cross five, four rows and five columns. Similarly, if you have five subjects and then there are seven semester, then the matrix which is connecting these two layers is called five cross seven, and then uh, this is like seven cross three and so on. So the most important thing is understanding this weight matrix. Okay. Now uh, this is what you know I have given in this slide. How do I will just skip that. Uh, and now, now the question is how do I systematically adjust this weight? Because I may give some mark and then I may get some output. How do I know that you know what weight I need to put? Initially I will put some random weight and then you know I weigh my mark and then threshold it and then pass it. Finally, it is not going to match with my CGPA or match with the output what I got. So in that case, what you need to do is you need to systematically adjust the weights and bring back these weights in such a way that no matter what is the input you are going to give, I'm going to give an output which is working well. And that is what we call as a prediction. So from the past data that you have given, I know how to set these weights in a systematic way, iterative way. Once if these weights are frozen, after that, you give me any new input, I am going to predict what is going to be your output. So the simple logic here we are going to use is something called back propagation. So what I mean by back propagation is here, as I mentioned, uh, the, the simplest approach is we use something called uh, the, the something called uh, uh, supervised learning. I give the input, I also I give the output. So you start with some arbitrary weights in between. For all these weight matrix, you put some, you know, random numbers, and then you multiply the input signal with that, and then you threshold because I said the activation functions can be fixed. It is going to generate an output. That output is again going to be weighted by these weight matrix, and then go to the next layer and so on. So finally, you arrive at a number. There is no guarantee that this number which you are looking at is what I want. Of course, there will be an error. Or in other words, what happens is, what do you want to get? And what you started off with will, will be very different. Or in other words, I need to calculate what is the amount of error I have. Because you know that when the amount of error that I have is known, what I should do is I have to go back and adjust in my weights in such a way that, you know, in the subsequent iteration, the error that I am going to get is minimized or it is getting converged. So when you do it iteratively, every time you change the weight, but you are not changing the weight second time in an arbitrary fashion. You are either increasing or decreasing in such a way that the, the weights are going to be reduced. Of course, how this magic is going to happen, well, what you need to do is, again, you can go back to your calculus. You know that when you want to optimize, especially when you want to minimize. When you want to minimize any error, 
all you need to do is you have to take the first derivative of the uh, you know output value with respect to each of these weight i may call w12 w22 w32 you can call by some name so you need to take the partial derivative of your total error with respect to this weight and then you know you can equate it to zero you know that how do you do a minimization in you know calculus the simple you know plus 2 problem you are going to do it so once if you are doing it now when i am adjusting for the first time all my weights it is going to tell me or it is going to be designed in such a way that after this iteration the amount of error that i am going to have is going to be lesser than what i thought so once if i adjust this weight so from this data i can again go back and ask what should be the weight adjustment here and then again i go back what should be the weight adjustment here and so on so all you need to do is use something called you know back propagation so once if you get one output you go back and adjust your weights in such a way that the the differential of uh, differential partial derivative of your total error with respect to the various weight elements of your neurons or neural network are minimized okay now again you know these are the various kinds of you know activation functions people may be using it as i said you know there are only two operations a neuron is doing one is you know multiplying the inputs and then adding and second is thresholding or finding you know an output right in that case the output can be of many kind people use unit step or sine linear piece wise linear logistic hyperbolic etc and so on so among these you know it's again you know it, it depends on whether you want the input to be continuous you look at here the unit step input is equal to output you don't want any change in your output you can use or if you are using something called a perceptron what happens is you want to get the negative input your output can be input can be anywhere from minus infinity to plus infinity but if your output you want to get either minus 1 or plus 1 then you have to use signum or if you want the logistic what happens is if your function is continuous if you are using a continuous function and then if the input values are anywhere between minus infinity to plus infinity but if you want to transfer your output to be between 0 to 1 so then i may be using logistic or sigmoid function so depending on you know what kind of output you are interested people may be you know using the sigmoid function so now the very interesting you know inventions has happened uh, you know breakthrough has happened so all along people have been using the sigmoid function in the past because uh, if you look at here this is the simple function which is used as an activation function in most of the neurons if you plot the sigmoid function 1 by 1 plus e power minus x what i get is this you know uh, blue color line so again you see that here i have varied my input it can be even minus infinity to plus infinity but always your output is bounded between 0 to 1 because people want to correlate your output with the probability theory when it gets an output they want to match it with some probability value so the input can be you know your marks can be between you know 0 to 100 which is what you give in any exam but then your output you want to be between 0 to 1 or even in the 0 to 1 when i threshold it when i say it is more than this i say you are pass that means when it is less than this you are saying fail and so on i can even do that so this is your actual input but a problem with the sigmoid function is as i mentioned when i want to use it for minimizing the error right i know what is the total error if this error has happened because of the thresholding then i want to minimize then what i should do is i have to take this function to be a continuous function that's why we have used 1 divided by 1 plus e power minus x and the interesting part of it is you know when when i want to optimize or when i want to minimize error i need to differentiate it you know that when i take a sigmoid function and then if i differentiate it what happens is if you look at for the same minus infinity to plus infinity of your x if you look at what is my f dash of x you see that the amplitude is falling to 0.25 so that means most of the data which you had in your error are going to drop if you are going to use a sigmoid function as an activation function so the the consequence is that if you are using a sigmoid function in all these neurons what happens is if i have 100% of an error here when i do this you know the minimization process only 25% will come to here and then when i go back from here to here if i ask how i should adjust the weight 25% of 25% which is 6% and then again if i go back here 
it is going to be 2%. So that means you started the weight adjustments here are going to only adjust your error correction by 2%. Here it is going to make it maybe 6%. So here it is going to make 25%. So you have lost 75% of your error data. And hence, you know, this was the problem which people have never noticed. And hence, you know, the neural networks have failed. Most of the neural network application was not able to generate the expected output. So the sigmoidal function actually forces our model is losing the knowledge from the data because the peak of the derivative function always appears close to 0 0.25. So to overcome this, what people have done is they have come with uh, a, a new kind of an activation function, which is what you see in many of the deep learning network people to it, wherein, you know, they use a function called softmax function, which is, you know, functionally represented like this. And then if you plug in these values here, no matter, you know, what is your input value, you will get always an output which is close to your, uh, you know, the probability values. So that means, you know, if you, you, you are uh, using the softmax function, you feed the input and then threshold is with the softmax function, you are going to get an output. And this output is always going to be some number between 0 to 1. But the beauty is when you add all of them together, you are going to get 1. Or in other words, suppose if I show you some letter, right, on alphabet, and then I scan it, and then I give it to my, uh, you know, deep learning algorithm, and tell me what is this letter. I, it is a handwritten letter. So somebody writes, you know, like uh, 1 and 7 in a very similar fashion. So it may say that 40% probability it looks like 1. 34% it may say looks like 7 and 20% it looks like 9 and so on. So in that case, I need to make a decision. So the, the softmax, what it does is wherever you have got the highest probability and to that, you know, classifier, it is assigning your output. So it doesn't have, you know, the fuzziness there. It decides that it should be most probably the letter 1 and so on. So that, that's where, you know, the uh, breakthrough came in the case of uh, you know, like uh, uh, deep learning. And the weights and biases for all nodes together are referred to as the parameters of the neural network model. So the weight matrix I have given, there is another term which is also used, which is called bias, which I have not mentioned here. So this bias is uh, typically, you can say, it is like a moderation when somebody is, you know, setting a question paper tough and then people want to give additional mark or people have indulged in malpractice, you want to cut down some mark, something like which is called constantly you do it for all nodes is called your bias or in terms of signal processing i can see that when the signal strength is small or the numerical value is so small i can boost it by using a bias value right so this bias is not going to change the characteristics of your system it is going to play only for numerical convenience or signal strength convenience so all these are called as parameters of our neural model but parameters other than weights and biases are called hyperparameters for example how many layers I can use it here? Can I use only two layers? Or how many nodes I can use? Can I use four, 10, 20? And all these are called hyperparameters. So a typical difficulty you are going to face in neural network or you know deep learning is how many hidden layers I will use or how many neurons I will use in each of these layer and, and how quickly they can learn. There are many such parameters are there. And there is another you know interesting factor which is also you know very important when you work with the deep learning or uh, maybe you know neural network is something called a loss function because from the word loss you can know that it is you know quantifying an error so yi is something an expected output and my f of xi comma w for a given input when it went through a weight matrix and then with the nonlinear activation function i got an output and then when i find a difference it is the error so when there are many such nodes i find the total error so I square it because I want to see that they are not, you know, canceling each other and so on. So this is an error function. So this error function, there are various ways you can define an error. Because when we talk about, you know, any metrics when you want to measure, there may be alternative choices. For example, when somebody wants to measure the height of a person, I can give it in feet, I can give it in meter, I can give it in centimeter and so on. But then, you know, if you look at numerically the values, if I talk in terms of, uh, you know, the feet, I may say at the maximum, the height of a person is around six feet or seven feet. The numbers are anywhere going to be, an, uh, let us say, a kind of a fractional number between, you know, zero to seven. But if I'm talking in terms of, you know, centimeter, it is going to be somewhere between zero to 200. So the numerical values are going to be, you know, very different. 
so when you make uh, the the proper choice of you know the error function again you know your convergence and then the way you can quickly converge and then uh, make your uh, you know weight matrix to converge and then you know which can understand the given input with the output can be very fast so what in many of these uh, deep learning papers you will see is that they will be using different kinds of loss function and in fact when you use one loss function versus other loss function sometimes you will see that the network may give you the result very quickly or it may give the results with a lesser number of data and so on so that is something you know we have to you know uh, you know look at it and there are also you know some certain performance metric people use maybe in some of the papers which i am going to discuss here people have used something called root mean square error for example you know what is the predicted value what is the actual value you you subtract and square and add and then you find an average and take a square root and that is going to be you know rsme using this rmsme i am going to tell how good or how bad my uh, results are now let's look at uh, you know some of the papers which i have referred i think you know some of you may be even attending i believe sayan roy and uh, uh, devanjan rana who have recently published this paper on machine learning in nonlinear dynamical systems on resonance in fact you know it's uh, it, it's going to explain what i have said you know in a in a simple logic so in this particular paper they have taken the lorentz nonlinear system so this is the lorentz equations of motion people who have worked in nonlinear dynamics you know that these are the underlying equations of motion and these are some of the parameters and if you fix these values and then if you iterate or integrate these equations you are going to continuously continuously get x of t y of t and z of t of course they are coupled you see that here y and x are connected here x and z are connected here x x and z are connected <clears throat> so what you do is you use a simple you know ranjikuta kind of a method which is available in many libraries continuously start with some initial condition and velocity and then you fix this value and solve it you are going to set, get a set of values you simply plot for example here they have used you know the x data here so this is you know ever uh, as the time goes on starting from 0 to 100 time units you look at what is the value of x at a different time and then you see that you know it is oscillating and then <clears throat> the most interesting part is they have used a parameter of eta equal to 10 power minus 6 and then you you see here the the dashed line or the orange line is something which we can obtain using your neural network so whatever neural network that i have discussed they have used to 20 neurons and then some layers and then they played around and then they have got you know these outputs and then whatever uh, the uh, blue color lines are there which is almost invisible that means because it is exactly matching it is called your true dynamics the point is here if you want to develop this true dynamics you need to know these equations if we don't give you these equations of motion you are not going to get these patterns whereas in the case of a predicted dynamics what i have done is i have taken all the input values which is you know scanned from here and then i am giving it to my neural network and then i am giving what is my output and then i am not going to give any of these equation and then i am asking my system you develop this mathematical model you derive this mathematical model that can simulate these you know output and they have found that the difference between the input and output is negligible in fact using the matrix of uh, rm sc they found that the total error is only 0.38% or in other words i can say that the neural network model knows nothing a priori about the governing equations of the data but still they are able to learn very well from the training data and predict the data in the test set and again you know if you are given a huge amount of data all i am going to do is i can pick even at random i say at time at time t equal to 90 and what is my amplitude value and then next one i can give at t equal to 75 what is my output value so for a different you know input values i can feed my data and i can tell what was the output that i have observed because it is a model where i want to test the existing system with my finding so your your uh, the neural network the weight matrix doesn't know any of these things i have not fed all these equations but it is learning and then it is able to reproduce my dynamics in fact the amount of error is 0.38%
And the second data set they have taken is something called a noisy time series data, which is also, you know, uh, you see here the uh, noisy time series data. What is there in blue is uh, numerically, you know, generated, artificially generated. And then at randomly, I pick this data and feed it to my neural network. And then I know what was the corresponding output at that time. I have given that as an output and asked my system, I have given you the input, I have given you the output, you build the model. Once if that model is built, I can give any input and then I can ask any output. And then whatever I have obtained, I have plotted. And in fact, again in this case, they have found that the amount of error between the input and uh, uh, you know the between the uh, model that you have generated and the model that has been generated using uh, neural network is only 3.88 percent and so on right so any doubts here otherwise i will move on to the machine learning problem ganeshan yes, uh, some time back uh, there were a lot of discussion on parameter yes. identification okay sir uh, okay yeah so if you have a uh, given set of data okay then uh, you have i mean you formulate a general dynamical equation and the problem okay. is to identify the parameters so okay. there uh, something similar to what you have been uh, telling the okay, sir. neural network model uh, like analysis uh, okay, were sir. essentially done so okay, sir. Probably these two have uh, some similarity. Uh, I, uh, I can see. Well, uh, sir, are you saying uh, this? You know, I have one slide later. Yeah. Yeah. Is this what you are uh, telling? You know, sir, something yeah. like, uh, uh, you know, the, the extension of it can be done. Uh, yeah. In the same paper, they have used something called uh, the uh, what they call sparse identification of nonlinear dynamical system where yeah. they were able to identify the parameters. Is it the same you are trying to say, sir? Yeah, I think it's something similar. Yes, okay, um, maybe, you know, uh, I don't know, you know that Palani Andy, who is okay, working sir. now at uh, Nehru Memorial College. And I think okay, for, his, yeah. for his thesis, he had done a lot of work uh, similar to that. So okay, uh, uh, maybe there is connection between these two uh, neural network modeling and parameter identification. Okay, sir. It's a nice input for me, and then I will also look into it, sir. Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, any other doubts? Otherwise, I will pass on to the next part of it. Uh, Ganesh, there is a question in the chat box. Can you read? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, just a minute. The chat box. Uh, uh, there is a question from Prashant, sir. As for the most of the nonlinear systems, it's uh, difficult to find the governing exact nonlinear differential equations. But as you said, we can train the machine to learn the particular nonlinear complex system. So, can we think of a machine that can learn the complex systems and give the exact model or governing nonlinear differential equations? I think this is what uh, you know, Professor Lakshmanan sir was also telling. Uh, I'm, I'm going to come to this part a little later. It is there in my subsequent slide. Yes, he is correct. Uh, so what you do is some observables. See, for example, when you do an experiment, like you know, uh, a pendulum in a magnetic field or an electric field, if you don't know what is the underlying equation of motion, you just to do the experiment. What is your input? And then what is the output that you are measuring? Once you have a data, Continuously, you do this experiment many number of times under different environmental conditions or different, let us say, magnetic field or electric field strength. And then you ask your, you know, the neural network, you give me what is the underlying equations of motion. It can, you know, generate some equations. I'm going to come to that point a little later. Yeah, that's it. Only one question. Okay, yeah. fine. Um, so shall I pass on to the next topic? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you can uh, stop uh, uh, sure. whenever you sure. feel like. I have, uh, you know, when the time exhausts you, please, you know, let me know. Now, yeah. let's look at, you know, what is Ganesan, there is a scroll bar. You can make it hide the the scroll bar. Stop okay. sharing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a near hide. You can you can make it hide. This this one. Can you see this stop sharing? Oh, stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. 
Oh. Near, near to that. Wait a minute. I have uh, made a mistake. Near to that, you can see hide. Oh, this hide. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah, make it full screen. No. It's not coming up here now. Oh, sorry. Again, you have to share even. No, mm. it's already mm. shared. Is it clear now? Yes. Is it visible? Yes. yes. Okay. Now let's move on to the another you know, interesting topic. Uh, what we have seen so far is uh, one of the most important topic to understand deep learning. Uh, you should understand what is the you know ANN. Now people are often getting confused to what is the difference between uh, the artificial neural network or machine learning and deep learning and so on. Of course, as I mentioned, there are subtle differences are there. So as you can see in this diagram, the deep learning is a subset of you know machine learning. So uh, if you take the deep learning is part of your machine learning and uh, which is again also a subset of you know artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is a, a big set and you have a subset which is machine learning under that you have a deep learning and so on. And so uh, the, the major difference is the machine learning is working on algorithms which learn by its own using historical data. When you want to use your machine learning algorithm there are many algorithms are there and uh, maybe we will touch upon one or two of them and it works only for specific domains for example if we create a machine learning model for detecting the dog it will not detect the cat so the problem is each of these machine learning algorithm will work only for a particular domain when you go to the other domain we need to again start from the you know uh, sample data right and the machine learning algorithms find and apply patterns in data what is the purpose of machine learning algorithm is they try to find some pattern which was not existing in your data, which you have never noticed is what it is going to do. And they use, you know, some of the statistical technique and probability to find the patterns in massive amount of data. So one of the interesting application what people have done using machine learning in US is that they found that the red color cars are making more accidents. In fact, they were uh, surprised. Now you go to US and then if you want to buy a car, if it is going to be red color, you have to pay more insurance or premium. The reason is they found from the historical data that whenever the car was red in color, it was making more accidents, which was not noticed. Then later they went into the psychologist and then they asked, is it true? They said, yes, people who are you know affectionate on red color, they are always aggressive in nature. So that means they are very likely to drive in a harsh way, thereby the probability of making them an accident is very high. And hence, you know, they have, you know, increased the price of it and so on. And uh, uh, what is, you know, in deep learning? Deep learning is also a class of machine learning algorithms, which uses multiple layers to progressively extract higher level features from the raw input. So here, as I mentioned, the number of layers that you talk in between the input and output are many. Now, why are you using many? Because if you take a simple image processing application, lower layers may only identify edges, higher layers may identify concepts such as digits, letter, faces, and so on. So in an image recognition application, raw input pixel may be a matrix of pixels. The first layer may abstract the pixels and encode the edge. Second layer may you know, arrange the pixels. Third layer may find some of the simple small objects like nose and eyes. The fourth layer may find even bigger objects like your face and so on. So that means when you add more and more layers, and then if you feed the weight matrix, uh, which is following your back propagation, which is going to adjust the weight between input and output in a systematic way, you are going to get systematically, you know, more and more connected objects, which are going to give you your uh, object that you want to identify. So DL can automatically discover features which are used for classification. Whereas ML requires the features which is to be provided. This is a major difference. When you are working on machine learning techniques, you may be using something called handcrafted algorithm. So that means you need to manually you know, do certain things. And then you can ask your system to find out and so on. Whereas when you use most of the deep learning techniques, what happens is even the extraction of these features are all going to be automatic. You are going to make more and more automation in the case of deep learning. And 
the DL needs and hence, you know, high end machines and considerably big amounts of training data to deliver the accurate results. So if you want, you know, accurate results, you need to have huge amount of data. I will show you a very nice, you know, example. Uh, you know, when I used to drive, maybe once I was driving from here to Vandavasi. So uh, sometime, you know, I found that there was a place where they have dug up the road. And then suddenly when I went near, there were no signboards. Or even if the signboards were there, it was not properly positioned. I could not see. Had I not applied my brakes suddenly, I should have met with an accident. So this kind of, you know, unexpected incidents can happen because they are all, you know, brought in at an ad hoc fashion. So if you want to detect it, at least if you take a signboard or maybe, you know, if you take a car or lorry, there is a structure is there. But there are objects which it doesn't have a structure or well-known structure. You need to have a huge amount of data. But then again, you know, by training these neural networks or maybe deep learning framework, it is possible for you to detect. For example, I will show you here. This is a live video. We have done it by testing. So it's a road between uh, Velo to Chitur. You see on the night I am driving, there is a take diversion board, and the, which is on the left-hand side. Similarly, if you go there at you know, different places, you see they may be located at what place, wherever you know the, uh, the, the civil engineer wants, he will keep it. So sometimes it is handwritten, sometimes it is like an arrow mark, sometimes it is in Tamil, sometimes it is in English, and so on. So what you need to do is you need to recognize all of them. And then if you want to alert, even before you are encountering them, then you need to have large amount of you know training data. Then only you know this deep learning is going to work. So typically we need good amount of you know computing, right? So next, uh, let me pass on to another you know interesting uh, uh, paper we have seen is something called sparse identification of nonlinear dynamical systems. You know somebody was asking, I have a complex system then I want to find what is the underlying equation of motion according to the neural network that you can give me. So that can be you know, shown here. So this paper, you know, I have given the reference here. So the idea of uh, this so-called CINDY is to obtain the governing equations of a nonlinear dynamical system, which has got D degrees of freedom from the entire time series of the data of a dynamical system. So if it is a T-dimensional system, I have uh, you know, values of these variables for each of these dimension at any given point of time is given. So specifically, my object is to get a dynamical equations of the form. You know that whenever you want to have a dynamical system, you need to have a derivative function. You need to be first or second derivative or third derivative will come into function. I mean, it is going to be a kind of, when you write numerically, it is going to be a set of first order differential equation where I say x dot equal to f of x t. This is how we have written all the other Lorentz equation and so on. So basically, I need to find what is this f or each of these variables. So the function f will determine the dynamical evolution depending on your case. Now let us take an example here. We take uh, uh, the uh, most of the you know uh, a typical case for as a case study. We take this uh, duffing oscillator. You know that it has got a cubic nonlinearity with a parameter beta that is attached to it. It's a you know uh, two degrees of freedom or two dimensional system x dot and y dot. So now I can write it in a matrix form in the following way. So here, these are two variables, x dot and y dot. I call these as one component, or maybe your output. And then what is this? This is the polynomial, which I call theta of x. So this polynomial here, you see here I have y, here I have x, here I have x cube. So what I do is, the pattern of the polynomial which I am choosing conveniently in my case is it can be 1 or x or y or x square, x, y, x square, x cube. These are the various permutations. If I'm talking of a cubic polynomial in uh, two variables, either all of them can be 0. In that case, I will get 1. Or I may have only x, only y. Or I can have, these are two possibilities. If it is a quadratic, I can have x square, y square, x, y. If it is cubic, x cube, y cube, x square y, x y square and so on. So these are the various permutation and combinations of the polynomial function that I can think of on the right hand side of this dynamical equation, which is represented by the theta of x. And what is this? And this is what is my weight matrix, which I have talked in my neural network. You see that, you know, this is my output and this is my input. So why do I put some 0, 0, 1 here? Because when you multiply 1 with 0, and x with the 0 and 1 with y. So you are going to get x dot equal to y. 
similarly here you see that there is a minus 1 here in second term when i multiply there is a minus x here and then you see that there is a uh, for the seventh term which is minus beta x cube you see here the seventh term is x cube when i put minus beta here it is there or in other words it's a simple you know matrix when you multiply this matrix form i am going to get this equation or in other words my equation of motion i have represented in terms of you know the uh, matrix so in this particular case you know this is my weight matrix now what i do is here theta x is the library of polynomial functions and i have two variables here and my weight matrix can be <laughs> so because this is my two inputs right i mean um, the input is to be connected with your output only two equations are there so i have got w and yeah. excuse me can i say uh, it seems uh, murugananda has said doubt yes. yeah actually this uh, what have happened if you have more than uh, two variable i mean multi variables are partial differential equation special mm -hmm. the extended mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. no i haven't uh, gone through the pde or you know Spatial because equation. this is two, only two variables, x and y, so you can yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. But if it is yeah. more and more, uh, 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 is there any work or you come across or something like that? Uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't know. Okay. I have okay. to find okay. Definitely okay. people should okay. have Thank done you. it. If they have done it here, I'm sure with the kind of, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, deep learning that is going on, 100% sure people should have done it. But unfortunately, I have not covered here. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, now basically, you know, what I'm going to do is here, uh, my interest is I want to find a dynamical equation, which is of this form, right? As I mentioned here, I want to go to this particular form, dx of t by dt equal to f of x comma t. So in that case, you know, I'm writing my right hand side as theta x into w. So you look at this equation here, this is my left hand side, x dot and y dot, this is your output. And what is your right hand side is theta x times my w then theta x into w and so on. So in this case, what I do is, now I have I, I have to find what is this. So essentially what I'm going to do is, like in the previous case, I take the actual equations of motion here, and then I continuously integrate it with numerically, and then I randomly pick these points, give it to my neural network, and then I find out what is my output. And then again, you know, I'm plotting here. It's a, uh, you know, uh, for this particular equation of motion, I'm going to get this one. So the uh, orange color is, is a true simulation and then the blue one is you obtained using your, you know, like a neural network. So you see that they you know they are, you know, matching with each other. So you know that the governing dynamics was this. And then now you know that you have used your neural network and then you ask what is your weight matrix? Because your theta wx is going to be your weight matrix. You ask what is your weight matrix? So in this particular case, you know, or you will find at the end of your iteration. Because when I say I'm, I'm building a model, at the end of all neural network, you need to tell what is the value of this weight matrix, which is connecting your input to your output. So if you ask this input to our output matrix, at the end of all, you know, uh, simulation, it is going to give these values. X dot equal to 0 0.9898 times Y, Y dot equal to minus 1.002X plus Y and so on. So here, you know, again, these x, y, x cube, etc., are coming because I have used in my theta of x here. So whatever I have given in theta of x, those are coming here. And this W matrix is telling what are these numerical values. Or in other words, using my numerical or, or neural network, I am I'm able to give some sample data. And then also I have seen what was my output. And then I am asking you give me what is the equation of motion. And then it has given me this is what I have used for original simulation. And this is what my neural network has given. So I'm able to get a kind of a mathematical model. So once it, this model is given to me, now you give me any new x value and y value at any point of time, I can able to tell what is going to be my x dot and y dot value simply by plugging into this and so on. So in fact, you know, they have found from their simulation, the amount of error between what you observed and what you did with the numerically or between uh, the Ranji Kuta method and the neural network was only 0.47% of their actual values. Now, you see that I have got an equation of motion which is complex, which is not exactly what you see in your mathematical, uh, you know, form, functional, close to form. But here, it is slightly different. But still, your, your data is saying that 
it is 0.47 percent having inaccurate value so and what is the model used in ASN? where here yeah no, they have, see what they have done is so this is uh, the uh, what you call uh, duffing van der poel oscillator no no no, 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 no not uh, in neural yeah. network model no neural network model huh? i think they have given in their paper how many okay. nodes and how many layers and so on for want of time i have not put in my slide if you go to this paper they have discussed it yeah okay right so all the details are there so the point i am trying is that i have derived a uh, i mean the only the nonlinear differential equation and functional form without using the exact you know equation of motion right the, the but the error is only 0.47% as long as this error is acceptable, you can do it because I need only some sample data. Do some experiment and find what is the output and then you ask, you give me what is the equation of motion you have. It is going to tell. And similarly, they have done another chaotic system, which is a Rosler Attractor, which is also very popular in many nonlinear dynamical systems. So this is given by this equation and they have chosen these values of A, B, C. And again, you know, they have predicted using the same approach. Now you see that. Uh, what you see in the uh, orange color line is the uh, simulation value. And then you see the blue color one is your actual uh, you know, mathematical solving of uh, your differential equation. But if you see that, there is some small error, right? So it works very nice for you know, the equations where you have the exact dynamics, like, you know, like uh, limit cycle kind of a thing. When there is a chaotic system, they found that there was some error. So this is the finding they had given, right? So chaotic systems as you all, and I'm not going into that part of it, but the idea is using the Cindy algorithm, it is possible for you to find numerically using neural network, what is the underlying equation of motion that governs your nonlinear system. Uh, Ganesan, you may go five yeah. or 10 minutes. Okay, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I will just, you know, skip because okay. I think, you know, this is, you know, your paper, I think, you know, your students, you have done it. So here, I mean, again, you have used a number of, uh, this is the equation of motion, which you people have taken. And then these are the parameters you have taken. And you have used, uh, you know, various models like, uh, you know, um, multi, uh, what is called, multi-layer perceptron and uh, convolutional neural network and LSTM, long short-term memory and so on. And again, you know, these kind of, you know, models are available in deep learning or sometime, you know, even in machine learning techniques. So these are all, you know, deep learning techniques you have taken. And then you have compared how much of your mathematical equation has been derived. And then the model that you have built, how much of error you have. I think, you know, they are reporting for a given equation and given model. Uh, they claim that LSTM is a better choice. And in another paper, again, you know, from your group, I believe, you have recently uploaded in the archive I have seen you people have used uh, many machine learning algorithm and here you have used various techniques. So one of them is called uh, the logistic regression. So it's basically a multivariable uh, linear functional form. All you are trying to do is you have a set of input and then you have set of an output. You are trying to find the, uh, what I call a curve fitting kind of a function. What should be the values of V0, V1, V2 and so on. So, and you got, you know, some results using some metrics, you say how much they are, you know, varying and so on. The other approach is using something called a support vector machine, wherein, uh, you know, you try to find uh, different values, which corresponds to X and Y, what is the Lakshman Rekha, you can do it. I'm, I'm, I'm skipping these things for want of time because each one of them are a separate topic. And normally I teach for an hour or two for each one of them to make a student to understand that. And third approach you have given is something called a random forest. And the fourth one is using, you know, multi-layer perceptron. And again, in this case, uh, you people have claimed that a multi-layer perceptron based machine learning technique can give a better accurate equations of motion for a given nonlinear dynamical system, right? Uh, I, I, I just to conclude, uh, uh, Sandil, if you have any doubt from people, I'm happy. Uh, maybe you wind up, then we will allow, we will give time to the audience. Okay, fine. Yeah.
Yeah, any question from audience? I'm ready to take. Murugandam, do you have some questions? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, there is a question. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, 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 no. He is uh, just asking me whether I am recording the mm -hmm. talk or not. Hello, yeah, there is a question. Yeah. Oh, please. Sir, this is Mayor again, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, your talk was very nice, sir. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir, uh, while tuning the hyperparameters for the optimization of the any model, mm -hmm. it takes long time for the optimization. So what's the right way of uh, tuning the hyperparameters of the model? It, it, it's again, you know, a toughest question. <laughs> Which optimizer will work and then people have to go through the literature and then we have to try. There is not a unique model where I can say that. In fact, it is one of the problem of any neural network and uh, you know deep learning. There are multiple parameters. How do you fix one and then how do you climb which is going to give an optimal result is always a, you know, a challenging task. So unless you have a domain knowledge and tried uh, with a few examples, you cannot do it. In, in, in fact, you know, we have seen in our uh, application Right, uh, the convergence was very poor when you have a uniform data. For example, when I uh, when I have you know a very bright sunlight during that condition, I have taken a video or an image. If I have trained the model, it works very nice. But then when I tested it in night time, it was a disaster. So then we realized that, and also when I take an object in close up, and then. If I train the system only for close-up object, and then while testing, if I see the object at a long distance, it was saying a car as a bus, bus as a car, and so on. So then later we realized that. That's why I said the problem is you need to give more variety and volume in your data. And then only you can decide uh, you know, whether uh, the hyperparameters, how to tune it, and so on. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm not sure, but you are, you are talking about you know, one-dimensional or mathematical equations. In our case, it may not be that difficult. We have an experience of more on video and images, and we had problems of size of the object, angle, uh, lighting, and so on, wherein we found that that was our biggest challenge. We never tried or, or tried how to make this hyperparameter can be tuned. So if you frankly tell me, you know, I don't have an answer. Yes, sir. Because, uh, because while training, uh, I have a very very amount of less, a very less amount of error values, sir. But in doing testing, uh, the error value is very high. Then I uh, come to know that that uh, algorithm stuck at a local minima. So we have to choose that type of parameter differently. So I'm asking that the right way of choosing type of parameter. No, no. As I said here, uh, it's uh, the problem here is when you train your system, you have to. We always call these in big data as uh, volume and variety. So you have to have varieties of data because if you take even a face recognition system and uh, maybe, you know, I apply a dye or I may wear a cap, I may wear a glass, I may remove a glass, I will wear a mask. I should be able to still say he is, you know, Ganeshan and so on. So that means unless you train the system with varieties, then only it can detect during the testing phase. If you have trained your system with a uniform kind of uh, data, then your testing is going to be going to give you a very poor results. So the simplest yes, solution sir. is your training data should have variety in it. Yes, sir. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it was a very beautiful talk. Uh, you, in big bis big business, mm -hmm. they have a very huge amount of data, like okay, uh, for example, airlines or hotel business and so on. Okay. So how, how, and I understand that many of them are using this uh, machine learning techniques. Okay. So what do they really do with their data there? Uh, so no, actually, it's a good question, sir. Actually, one of the approaches in uh, machine learning is they do something called clustering of the data, sir. They see some pattern and then they cluster the data and then from that data they filter and then they apply, you know, some sort of, you know, what we call recommendation system. So a simple example I can tell you is, uh, suppose if I see in Amazon or Flipkart, 
where they have crores of uh, objects are there and billions of customers are there what they do is whenever you log in they store what kind of products you are buying how much you are buying how frequently you are buying and then they are looking for somebody who has got a similar preference in their database by doing a pattern matching so in that case they are clustering your data in a, in a, in a uh, i would say in a multi dimensional space they look at a similar customer and when they see that a similar customer has purchased a product you are also very likely to buy the same product if he has purchased a different product then they are basically if they look at mostly they use you know statistical techniques and correlation techniques for example if you buy a if you, if you are specifying that you are buying an iit je coaching book for physics then they also look at in the base database they find that the correlation that this fellow will buy a chemistry book or mathematics book is very high and that's where they are uh, uh, you know computing this correlation coefficient between one profile of a person and another profile of a person if you have the highest correlation with uh, other customer whom you have never met he is seeing what are the products he has done and that he is bringing in and then showing it as a recommendation okay so basically they are trying to evolve some kind of statistical models yes so sir yes sir you are correct you are correct sir you are correct okay thanks uh, thanks ganesh thank you sir thank you so any other questions from uh, participants mani andan are you still there you at one stage you raised a hand oh it seems he is not there so uh, i'm not seeing any other questions uh, ganesha so uh, thank you sandeep yeah so since there are no more questions uh, i would like to conclude the session by thanking dr ganesha for giving a very wonderful talk um, introductory talk uh, to machine learning and uh, deep learning he also discussed uh, a very recent paper so thank you very much uh, for accepting our invitation and giving you a very wonderful talk ganesh okay uh, i am not sure as i said you know sendil <laughs> i i have started preparing all this ppt today morning at only 3 o'clock uh, okay. so i did my level best i am not sure because i am not keeping track of all this thanks okay. to some of the papers which you have sent uh, i have gone through in the morning and then i have got some ideas based on our work i try to connect uh, i don't know how far it will be useful for uh, uh, your student but i hope that you know no, i also I, learned the, something the about. paper has also been accept i mean also appeared in the journal okay. i will send a cop i will send a copy to you sure okay. sure yeah. i will invite you to give a series mm -hmm. of lectures okay no uh, problem yeah no problem. Organize. thank you very okay. much uh, ganesha uh, uh, thank you sandil thank you for thing, the yeah other things i will write to you fine thank you yeah. thank you yeah. thank uh, you, you muruganandam uh, thank you thank you sir thank you i didn't know that you were there <laughs> <laughs> when i saw uh, the list you originally i didn't see you thank no, you very much nice coming come late actually little late oh i see i see thank you so thank you thank you thank you very nice actually bye. Bye. so the beginning part i was not there but it's okay, okay. <laughs> i will bye. yeah okay, uh, uh, sendil can you send the recorded video link maybe in a sure uh, sure i'm uh, planning yeah i'm plan yeah. i'm planning to uh, put it in a or i mean a cluster or something <laughs> okay no no you can put it in the drive you know google drive and then yeah, send sure, me a link sure. i can download it yeah sure sure okay thank you okay, thank, thank you, you. Okay, bye thank you bye i'm closing the recording thank you